Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And uh, welcome to this Ophir Photonics webinar. My name is Mark Slatsky, Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions here at uh, Ophir Photonics. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, the topic we're going to discuss, we discuss related topics quite often, those of you who are connected with us in various ways. Today's discussion will actually be somewhat different. Um, the whole field of high power lasers, industrial applications uh, is very large and very interesting. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is, as the names, as the title says, we're not going to be fo focusing on technical principles, which I love doing, that's the physicist in me, but rather we're going to be focusing on the eminently practical, which is what the engineer in me likes doing, uh, challenges and solutions. Um, just before we begin, on a more uh, logistical note, the total time of today's webinar should be approximately 45 to 50 minutes, something like that. Questions and comments are welcome and even encouraged. If you have any questions or comments, please use the text chat box on the right side of your screen, and I'll do my best to respond either in real time or uh, at a suitable point in the flow of the information. If I'm already mentioning that, uh, then uh, let me just add that I'll leave my contact information up on the final slide for a minute or so after we're done in case you wanna contact me offline. And if I'm already mentioning all that, uh, let me just point out that we do wanna make it as easy as possible for you to get a hold of us. If there's any way at all in which, uh, in which we can help you, or if there's something you, you know, some feedback you want to share with us on every page of our website, uh, there is at the bottom of the page a field. I don't remember if we call it uh, request support, ask expert, contact me, whatever, you know, some, something along those lines. And of course, you can contact us through our either Ophir office or our representatives, distributors, partners in your various countries. Um, okay, if you don't, uh, follow all of that, then we're, we're probably okay. Uh, all right, so uh, let's, uh, let's plunge, plunge in. Um, I should probably just add today's webinar I'm actually doing from home for various reasons. In the unlikely, I hope, event that there's any kind of a glitch with my internet or my electricity, we actually had a problem last week, which is the reason I'm mentioning this. Please bear with me, give me a minute or two to go out, come back in. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, but hopefully, please God, we won't come to any of that. Uh, okay, I'm assuming those of you who are joining a webinar like this are at least to some degree familiar with Ophir. Um, as you may or may not know, some years back, we were acquired by Newport, and then a few years after that, Newport along with Ophir became part of MKS Instruments. Basically, if I can drastically summarize what it says on this slide, uh, we like to do the hard stuff that you would be more than happy to get off your head so you can focus on your work and not have to lose any sleep over the tools that you're going to need to help you get uh, your work done. I think that's a fair summary. Uh, okay, so here's what we're going to be talking about today. We'll just, uh, uh, although I did say we're not going to focus on the technical principles, we're going to do a very brief, but I mean very, very brief, overview just of the most basic uh, concepts so that we can sort of be on the same page, but uh, really, really very minimal. And then we'll be able to move forward, uh, forward with that. So in no particular order, by the nature of a topic like this, where we're going to be discussing challenges, meaning common issues that those involved in measurements or otherwise controlling high power laser processes uh, are likely to run into, uh, so if this is no particular order, but uh, kind of, maybe there's a little bit of order here. We're going to talk about pre uh, preventing laser damage. That's of some passing interest. Uh, issues related to cooling of these high power sensors, keeping the sensor clean. I worded this sort of carefully. I include in this both the importance of keeping it clean before it gets unclean and getting it clean once it has become not clean. I'll explain all of that when we get to there. I should just add that the solutions that we're going to be looking at, they're sort of dividable into two types. We're going to talk about solutions in terms of technical solutions that are available in equipment that's 
measurement equipment that's out there on the market. And maybe it's something you might want to keep your eye open for if you're at the stage of shopping. And the other category of solutions is maybe more along the line of best practices, things that you can do to preferably avoid having the problem altogether or having run into it. Nevertheless, being able to get out of it with uh, you know, as little uh, pain as possible. So continuing with this list, thermal offset, that's a bit of a subtle topic, but it's a topic that comes up and it's, it's actually quite fascinating. Those are usually the worst. <laughs> um, backscatter and footprint and production floor integration, these last two kind of go together. All right, so with uh, that done, let's begin with what I promised to be a very, very short overview of the basics, just what's required to be able to carry on and discuss the challenges and the solutions. The sort of applications we're talking about, I mean, obviously it's academic applications, but by and large, the vast majority of industrial, commercial, what I like to call real world applications of high power lasers, and I'm on purpose not defining from what number high power begins, obviously. Um, the vast majority of these applications are in the general category that we might call material processing. Uh, heavy duty or not so heavy duty, automotive, aircraft manufacturer, things like that. Cutting, welding, cladding, drilling, any kind of uh, what we might call brute force applications, excuse me, where we're using the power of a laser beam to uh, burn, zap, vaporize, and otherwise process the materials. Here you can see a uh, jet engine turbine blade. I hope the resolution is high enough that you can see the pattern of cooling holes here. That's something that would almost certainly have been impossible or close to impossible to manufacture using traditional mechanical um, production methods. Okay, the very, very, very basic review of how these high power laser sensors work. We're absorbing the laser beam. The absorbed optical power is turned into heat and we measure the flow of heat. Why we do it that way, it sounds kind of like this beyond the scope of today's discussion. So basically we have a metal disc on which we have a heat detector, thermopile. That's for the conversation that we're not having today, how that works, what it means. Uh, in this image, we're looking at the inner side of such a disc. The laser beam would be coming towards you. You might want to jump out of the way from behind the plane of, uh, of your screen. And the absorbed light turns into heat, which spreads radially outward. And this heat flow detector measures the heat flow and turns it into an electrical signal which goes out to the other half of the measurement instrument and that would be the the meter the display different manufacturers use different terminology the controller the reader all sorts of different words of course that heat now has to go somewhere so the body of the sensor is going to be designed to be able to get rid of heat at up to the rate for which this sensor is rated and designed. So for example, if this is a sensor designed for measuring up to one kilowatt continuously, then whoever designed the sensor will have designed the body of the sensor to be able to dissipate heat at a rate of up to one kilowatt. Through various means, which we're gonna look at, this sensor is not designed to measure one kilowatt continuously. This sensor is dissipating heat just through conduction with the air. We're gonna, as we're going to see shortly for the kind of powers we're talking about today, the sensors are usually going to be water cooled. Um, so what I have here is just exactly such a disc, an old damaged disc. Uh, here you can, I hope you can see that there is that thermopile ring. Okay. And the two leads coming out. This side is where the laser beam would be incident. Now the way the rest of the sensor is going to be configured is that all the light coming in is going to come in only within this area. Everything from here outwards, everything from here outwards is going to be hidden behind the sensor's mechanical front flange. We want all the heat being generated by an incoming laser beam to be captured and measured by this ring. So we want to make sure that none of that beam lands anywhere outside. So the 
sensor will be designed so that only this area is actually exposed to the laser beam. Uh, you might also be able to see here that there are channels in the structure of the disk. That's where the cooling water is going to be flowing. Uh, here I have some smaller disks. These are for obviously lower power sensors. I hope you can still see the thermopile there. And somewhere in this area is going to be the aperture of the sensor. The rest is, again, going to be hidden behind... Um, the sensor's mechanical structure. Here's an even smaller, uh, an even smaller disk. I mentioned the other half, the output of the measuring instrument, the meter. So here you see an example of, of a meter uh, plug cable going out to to the to the sensor. Um, I should mention that I'm keeping the information as generic as possible so that it'll be helpful, as helpful as possible to as many of you as possible, including those of you who are using equipment, God forbid, that's not Ophir. Uh, the concepts are the same. The particular details of the implementation might not necessarily be, but uh, that's probably not really relevant. Um, okay, so the absorbed laser beam becomes heat. The heat flow is proportional to the power of the beam. The constant of proportion is what we measure when we calibrate the sensor. Okay, now when we're dealing with very high power beams, we have to keep in mind an interesting fact, and that's that the damage threshold, the maximum power density above which the sensor's absorber is at risk of getting burned, of getting damaged, that number depends, among other things, on the power of the beam. At higher powers, that number becomes lower, meaning worse. So for very high power beams, we use a trick that I think is pretty much standard practice in the industry. I hope you can see in the aperture of the sensor that there's a reflective cone, a gold-colored, actually gold-coated reflective cone. And uh, what happens there is that instead of the absorber being perpendicular to the incoming beam, as it is with lower power sensors, uh, instead of hitting, coming in and directly meeting the absorber, the beam comes in and meets this reflective cone, and the beam is reflected radially outward, 360 degrees, um, to, and, and the vertical wall around it, in this image, that wall, vertical wall is perpendicular to the plane of your screen, that vertical cylinder, that wall, that's the absorber. And by giving the reflected beam a divergence angle, what we've done is we've expanded the beam so that by the time the beam actually reaches the absorber, the power density has gone down. The beam is larger. There's a divergence angle in it. So if the beam came in with so many kilowatts per square centimeter power density, it now has fewer kilowatts per square centimeter or the same number of kilowatts, but more square centimeters. So we're enabling the sensor to handle higher power densities than it otherwise would have considering the high powers that this sensor is going to be asked to measure. And here you see a few examples of such sensors. Here you can see the water connectors. I mentioned these sensors are generally water cooled. You can see that reflective cone in the aperture of the sensor. This sensor happens to be uh, designed for up to 16 kilowatts. I should mention, oh, I started to mention that we, I'm, I'm doing my best to keep the information as generic as possible. The one sentence I forgot to say is that when it comes to showing actual examples of real devices, uh, you'll appreciate that I'm going to be using Ophir devices because those are the ones, obviously, that I'm able to talk about. And here's another sensor that uh, is designed for measuring up to 120 kilowatts. That's not a mistake. Um, it's, it looks big. It's actually a desktop device. It's a 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. I'm going to come to the point a little bit later on in our discussion of explaining what this module is. And just for completeness, I'm showing an image of another model of meter. Okay, that was the introduction. Overview of basics. I said it would be short. I hope it was sufficiently short, but not too short to do its job. Preventing laser damage. Okay, I already kind of hinted at uh, laser damage caused by too many kilowatts per square centimeter. Okay, one of the most important parameters in any laser power sensors data sheet 
is the damage threshold. There are actually two kinds of damage threshold. One of them is, as you see here, the maximum average power density. In this example, it happens to be 10 kilowatts per square centimeter. The other one, which is less relevant to our discussion today, is the maximum number of joules per square centimeter when we're dealing with a pulsed beam where the energy density of each pulse is also a factor that we have to take into account. Um, I should mention that uh, we always recommend having a safety margin in place. There are always tolerances. Your beam power might be a little higher than you think. The beam power might be exactly what you think, but its size might be smaller than you think. Or its power and its size might be exactly what you think, but there might be hot spots in it where the local power density is higher and it could end up causing laser damage at one spot within the within where the beam is incident on the sensor. So we always recommend working as far as humanly possible at not more than 50% of the specified damage threshold so that you have a good safety margin and you can you know, sleep well at night. I briefly mentioned, and I want to explain it now, that the, pow the maximum power density that a given sensor's absorber can handle, that the one of the two types of damage threshold is not a single fixed number, but actually it depends on the power that we're exposing the sensor to. I want to explain why that is. So the x-axis is our absorber. The y-axis is the temperature. So let's say we have a typical absorber, in Ophir's case, our workhorse absorber, um, the, by far the most commonly used absorber. We just call it the, excuse me, the thermal broadband or BB absorber. So let's say we have our BB absorber here, and let's say we have a sensor that's rated for, you know, for 10 watts. So we've got a 10 watt beam coming in. The spot at which the beam is being absorbed is quite hot because the beam is being absorbed there and that light that's coming in and getting absorbed is turning into heat. So at that absorption spot, the temperature is kind of high and the heat is propagating sideways through the material of the absorber and the metal disc that the absorber is on. There are absorbers that are a coating, there are absorbers that are cemented on windows, doesn't really matter for our purposes now. Uh, here you see a screenshot from actually the thermal simulation software that our engineers use when they design these sensors. And you can see that there's a kind of hot spot at the center where the beam is actually being absorbed. And as you move away from it, the area just around it is quite warm. And as you move a little farther away, it's already getting cool. Now let's use that same absorber and expose it to a high power beam, a kilowatt, let's say. So the spot where the beam is being absorbed is not kind of hot, it's really hot. And there's a lot of heat being continuously generated as the beam continues to come in. So the area around that spot is also not warm. It's also very hot, not as hot as the absorption spot itself. You get the idea. And here's that, that screenshot from the thermal simulation. Now, heat being generated here has a much harder time propagating out of the way than heat being generated here because this heat finds itself in the middle of a very crowded room and it's going to have a much more difficult time getting out of the way, pushing past all that other heat that's in the surrounding area, <clears throat> which means that it'll take quite a bit fewer kilowatts per square centimeter to raise the temperature of this spot high enough to damage it than is the case over here where you'll need a lot more kilowatts per square centimeter because the heat that's being generated here has a relatively easy time running out of the way. So in, at Ophir, we always specify the damage threshold of our sensors at the highest power for which a given sensor is rated because if you're buying a one kilowatt sensor, it's probably because you're planning on measuring powers somewhere near one kilowatt. So it wouldn't really do you a whole lot of good to just give you a nice number and then in the fine print write, oh, but that's for one watt. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind when you're comparing specifications. Be sure that you're clear on what power level that damage threshold is being stated for.
while still on the topic of avoiding laser damage, I want to mention something about beam alignment. This is specifically for these kind of high power sensors that use that reflective cone trick. Uh, it's important to keep the beam centered and normal incidence. Um, why is that? Okay, so here we see what happens when the beam really is properly centered and it's coming in at normal incidence. It hits the center of the cone. And as we said, it's being reflected radially in all 360 degrees full circle together with that divergence angle. And so the cylindrical wall absorber around that cone is getting a beam that everywhere, you know, a beam, let me structure my sentence properly, everywhere within which the power density is pretty much uniform and safely below the damage threshold. What happens if my beam is not properly centered? So it still gets reflected radially and it still gets that divergence angle, but it's not being reflected in 360 degrees because it didn't hit the center of the cone. It hit only one side of the cone. So it's being reflected with a divergence angle, but we have a whole lot of kilowatts per square centimeter that should have been going in this direction, all going in this direction. And so the local power density in this area is not going to be safely below the damage threshold. And here's what can happen um, if we have our beam not properly centered, we've got that reflective cone. And on one side, we might have a few laser burn marks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you for a second because I'd like to show you uh, how this is expressed in one of our sensors data sheets just so you'll have an idea about what those comments mean. Uh, how do I do this? Share content screen. Here we are. Share. Okay. I hope you can see this. So here you can see the specification for two different high power sensors, both of which employ that reflective cone trick. And when we specify the maximum, I don't know if you, I hope you can see my cursor. I forget it, the cursor, but it, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I count that right? Eight items down in the data sheet, maximum average power density. You'll notice that it's not a number. It says we refer you to the notes and to a table. So let's scroll down. Note C is the note that we're talking about here. For circular beam, this, the damage threshold that's specified there, is for a circular beam centered within a quarter of the beam diameter. And in capital letters, improperly centered beam can cause damage to sensor. And maximum tilt angle plus minus five degrees, because otherwise, again, we run the risk of having the power density not uniformly distributed, but being concentrated off to one side, and we run the risk of damaging our absorber. Okay, next item is cooling. As we mentioned, we're absorbing a laser beam and that's generating heat and that heat has to go somewhere. So I mentioned that low power sensors, okay, you know, conduction out to the air, that's not really what happens in the kind of power regimes that we're talking about. So generally we're talking about water cooling and in a facility that uses a 20 kilowatt laser, there's quite certainly going to be water cooling infrastructure because the laser is water cooled. And so that same infrastructure will most likely be used for the sensor as well. So there's a few different ways of implementing water cooling. Most common way is to use that thermopile. Remember that disc that I showed you, the sensor itself, there's water channels built into the structure of the disc. Uh, you can see the water connectors here. Uh, that's a protective cover with a target that's used for alignment. Um, that's and okay. That that's the more common method. There are other methods. One of them is the calorimetric method of using water to cool the sensor. What that means is uh, well, I'll explain it by referring back to that example that I mentioned that I was going to explain that 120 kilowatt sensor. Um, what happens here is that we're for various reasons, again, it's beyond the scope of our discussion why we designed it that way for this sensor, but that way for the other sensor. Be that as it may, what we're doing here is we're not measuring heat flow as it moves past a radial thermopile ring. Uh, 
what we're doing here is we're measuring the change in the increase in temperature of the cooling water on its way in compared to on its way out. And we're also measuring the flow rate of that cooling water. And those two pieces of information combined together, the instrument derives from that the power in the beam. Remember that calorimetric thing? We're going to meet it again in a couple of minutes. Um, here we have another configuration. This is meant more for like the job shops type of, uh, of applications. Uh, we call it a power puck. I always thought that was a standard industry term. I understand that it's actually an Ophir term, but whatever, uh, where the, there's a certain mass of a given metal with an absorber coating on it and integrated electronics. The user has to expose that puck to the high power beam for a precisely controlled number of seconds, which means that the total amount of heat that's being generated there is fixed. And then the instrument, the programming in the instrument takes into account the heat capacity and the mass of the metal, blah, 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 blah. And it calculates from that the power. That's, uh, that's not calorimetric. That's more, I guess we could, it is calorimetric. Okay, yeah, we're absorbing a given number of calories or joules of total energy and, re and relating that to the power of the beam that was coming in. Okay, we often, 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 often get asked about uh, water type to use as coolant. Most users, I think, probably just use the standard city tap water that's available wherever it is that they are. In most cases, that might actually be okay, but it might not be okay. Um, when we're talking about a cooling water facility that's where the water is passing through a laser cooling system, and it's passing through the sensor cooling channel, and maybe a few other things uh, along its route, uh, there are situations where one or the other of those items along the water's path suddenly gets corrosion damage. And whether there will or will not be corrosion depends on all kinds of parameters, starting with most critically what ions happen to be dissolved in that, in that water and what metals and what materials the water meets along its circuit and so on and so on. I'll just, I'll just say that there are highly expert professional consultants out there who earn, who earn their living by helping customers deal with corrosion problems, not only in this context. It can, be, it can get pretty complicated and pretty subtle. So I, I'll, I'll just mention, uh, when I was relatively new in Ophir, I visited a customer in a particular industrial zone, um, and that customer was using a certain uh, water-cooled power sensor. In the same industrial zone was another customer in a different, app, different area a different application that happened to be using the exact same model of water-cooled sensor. This customer that I was visiting was suffering from corrosion damage inside the water channels of their sensor, and the other customer wasn't. And they were both using the same tap water in their cooling system. It took quite a while to sort that one out. Um, so people often ask us, okay, what do we recommend? What kind of water to use? Um, we actually did quite a bit of research into this over the years, and the conclusion that our R&D physicists came to was that deionized water, I know it has a bad reputation sometimes, but DI water is probably the best choice, subject to one important condition, and that is that the pH level is kept neutral. And there are relatively straightforward ways of making sure that the pH is kept neutral. There are additives, titration, whatever. Um, that whatever, by the way, I'm not going to just leave you with that. Towards the end of our discussion, I'm going to point you in the direction of a white paper with very detailed information about that by the R&D physicist that led to that, that research work. Um, tap water often can work, but or except for when it doesn't. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, cooling water flow rate, temperature, pressure, those are numbers that appear in the data sheets of all of these sensors. Generally speaking, the flow rate, couple liters per, per you know, so and so many liters per minute, depending on the side, you know, the power rating of the sensor. Um, generally speaking, I will mention that in our data sheets, we always give a, uh, 
recommended flow rate at full power and a minimum flow rate at full power if it's difficult for you given your facility to operate at the recommended flow rate you can operate at a lower flow rate down to the minimum recommended the minimum flow rate that we specify for operating at full power there may be some funny things hap that happen in the response time but it won't affect the accuracy but there's a minimum flow rate below which uh the heat will no longer be removed at the necessary uh, at the necessary rate the temperature range of the cooling water we usually specify something like 15 to 30 degrees celsius or something like that I'll tell you a secret, don't tell anybody that I said this. Usually nothing will really happen if you go slightly above or slightly below. Um, more important than the absolute temperature or flow rate is actually the stability of the temperature and the stability of the flow rate. Uh, if you go considerably below the minimum recommended temperature, then two things might happen. One, there might be condensation because of moisture in the air on the now colder than usual absorber surface, and that could affect performance. And another thing that might happen is that if there's too big a temperature difference between the water-cooled body structure of the sensor and the surrounding air, then heat is going to flow from the warmer air to that significantly cooler sensor body and as soon as you get remember these sensors are measuring heat flow they don't know how to tell the difference between heat flow that's being generated because of an incoming laser beam and heat flow that's being generated because of something else and this is one of those something else's so something to keep in mind um, in terms of stability a change of one degree celsius per minute can be picked up by these sensors so the stability of the temperature and the flow rate should be quite stable. If you have difficulties because of, you know, quirks in your facility about uh, flow rate, if there are spikes, then we recommend using some kind of a ballast tank to prevent those spikes from affecting the performance of the sensor. Another thing we're often asked is the cooling capacity. We're often asked, do we recommend a particular chiller or whatever? The answer is no. We're, you know, our the requirements from the point of view of the sensor are actually very forgiving. The stability, the temperature, you know, just knocked my headset off. Um, you know, all of those are pretty straightforward. The only thing that's really a requirement is the cooling capacity. What does that mean? If you're going to be using this sensor to measure a 10 kilowatt laser beam, you'll need a chiller that can chill at least 10 kilowatts of power, remove at least 10 kilowatts of power from the water. That's basically the only requirement that we have from the sensor's point of view. So as I said, from our perspective, the requirements are actually quite forgiving. Um, moving right along. Still on the topic of cooling water, um, I'm not going to go back to show you the image, but there are some sensors that have a really nice feature, and that's an alarm and interlock. At Ophir, we actually have only one model at this time that has that feature. Basically, what that feature does, and I'm mentioning it so you can keep your eye out for it because it's a very good thing to have, is it detects a problem in the cooling water flow. And if it notices, for example, that all of a sudden there's no cooling water flow, it, you can connect it and configure it so that it'll instantly disable the laser so that you don't get, you know, 16 kilowatts continuing to come into your sensor if the sensor is not being cooled. Um, okay, very, very important point. You have your high power laser, you have your cooling water system, you have your sensor, okay? You want to get to work, you're getting ready, all your equipment is set up, you turn on the laser, okay? You turn on your power meter, you check that the settings of the chiller are what they should be, and then you turn on the chiller, okay? Everything's working, you turn back and you see that your sensor has been turned into a puddle of liquid metal on your, on your desk. All right, I'm exaggerating ever so slightly. Turn on the cooling water before you turn on the laser. Those few seconds in which there's no cooling water, but 16 kilowatts of power are blasting into your sensor, that can do a lot of damage. And you'd be surprised 
at how often we get damaged sensors coming for repair from seasoned laser professionals. It's easy to overlook these things. So uh, very, very important to keep that in mind. I mentioned I'd be pointing you in the direction of detailed information about cooling water. There's an excellent white paper on our website by the physicist that did all of that work. Um, the, article, the title of the white paper, okay, you'll remember this, How to Use Water-Cooled Ophir Sensors. Okay, that's a pretty good title. Let me just show you uh, where you can find that article. Whoops, what did I just do? Where you can find that article. I'm going to share my screen for a second again. Share content, screen, share. Here we are. Uh, okay, you go to the main page of Ophir Photonics. Support Knowledge Center. Okay, and in the search, you just, okay, as you can see, I've already done this, so it kind of remembers me. Water cooled sensors, search, and one of the first things that are going to come up how to use water cooled Ophir sensors. Okay, very, very detailed, excellent article. Uh, I can say so because I'm not the one who wrote it. Flow conditions, uh, flow rate recommended, minimum, absolute minimum. Remember, we mentioned these. The pressure drop and so on and so on. Maximum, minimum. Uh, water, water inlet temperature range. Uh, what happens if I'm not working at full power? Can I use a slower flow rate? Stability, uh, corrosion, those additives, which to use, which not to do, and so on. Okay, highly, highly recommended. Um, okay, important point, avoid, to avoid damage when you're using the calorimetric type sensors. Remember I said, remember those because we're going to come back to them. So we, as we said, some sensor types measure the temperature increase in the cooling water coming in versus going out or going out versus coming in and the flow rate. So that means that there's a temperature sensor at the input of the water and at the, out, the inlet and at the outlet. And somewhere in between the two, there's a water flow meter, a water flow sensor. Um, when you're done with your work and you're putting the sensor away, you disconnect everything, you empty out the cooling water that's still there inside the water channels. And you want to be careful. You don't want to leave water residue in there because... Not a good thing to do. So stop, wait. Please do not use pressurized air blown through those water channels to purge the channels of water residue. That can and most likely will destroy the water flow sensor that's in there. And I'm saying this because we've seen this again and again and again. Um, with regular thermal pile water cooled sensors, no problem. But with these sensors, there's no shortcut. You need to empty out the water and just let it drip dry and air dry. A air dry, not high pressure blow air dry, just atmospheric air dry. Uh, okay, we've seen that so many times. It's painful, so something very helpful to keep in mind. All right, keeping the sensor clean. What you're looking at here is what probably started off as some kind of organic process residue on a thermal sensor that did not get cleaned off after it was deposited and at the next exposure to a laser beam it got burned on. Okay, there's no way to clean that off once it's burned on. That sensor needs a disc replacement which is unfortunate because that's like half the cost of a new sensor. Uh, had the user cleaned it off right away it would have been as simple as a soft tissue and a standard type of solvent, uh, you know, yeah, ethanol, acetone, something like that, and it would have been good as new. Uh, so, you know, to paraphrase an old common statement, a milliwatt of prevention is worth a kilowatt of repair, something like, something like that, okay? So if there is some kind of contaminant on the sensor, clean it off before the next exposure to a laser beam. It'll be much easier to clean off then. It'll probably be difficult or impossible to clean off after a laser exposure. What to use to clean it, that depends on what sensor type, what the absorber is. That's something you'll want to check with the manufacturer of the sensor. So for example, with that thermal, that Ophir thermal broadband BB absorber, it's a ceramic coating. It's very forgiving. Acetone, ethanol, some commercially, 
the bottom line is check with the sensor manufacturer how that particular model of sensor should be cleaned and then then you're good um, prevention is even better than is even better than cleaning which which is a prevention that's even better than damage uh, so for some of our high power sensors we have this optional accessory out of fear it's a protective cover with a remotely operated uh, solenoid that opens up that that uh, aperture when you want to take a measurement and then closes it back again when you're not measuring so that the process debris won't settle on the sensor and do this. Okay, thermal offset. Um, let me just start with an example. I was actually quite new at Ophir. That was like, uh, what is it, 18 years ago already. Um, I had a customer had a problem that he was using a high, relatively high power sensor. You know, he got to work in the morning, went into his lab, started taking measurements, and the measurement was, the reading was just changing, changing, changing as the minutes went by, drove him crazy. What's the problem? Turns out that uh, the sensor had been sitting in his car in the sunny parking lot in, you know, the Israeli summer sun. Uh, gets quite hot in there. He brought the sensor into his air-conditioned lab. The temperature in the lab was probably a few tens of degrees cooler than the temperature in the car and he started measuring now remember these sensors measure heat flow you bring a hot sensor into an air a cool air conditioned lab the sensor is going to start giving off heat as it tries to reach thermal equilibrium with its new environment and as we mentioned these sensors don't know how to tell the difference between one kind of heat flow and another kind of heat flow. So there was heat flowing from the innards of the sensor out its body into the air. There was also heat that was flowing from the absorber into the sensor and out. The, you know. So that heat flow caused by the sensor not being in thermal equilibrium with its environment was interfering with the measurement of the heat flow of that was being caused by absorbing a laser beam and that was what the problem that was what the problem was um now you might think okay let me sh let's have a close-up of this uh meter again Ophir meters and probably other manufacturers as well have a button that says offset. That offset button, if I press it, it subtracts the current value of the reading and continues to subtract it from all subsequent measurements until I deselect offset. Okay, so you might think, okay, I walked into my air conditioned lab. Oh, I've got an offset because even though I haven't turned on my laser, the sensor is radiating heat into the room that's giving me a reading. It doesn't realize that that, that heat flow has nothing to do with a laser. And so why don't I zero out that unwanted offset by pressing the offset button? No, not a good thing to do. Why not? Because as the sensor cools and approaches thermal equilibrium, it might take an hour, but as it does so, that offset is going to decrease. And eventually it's going to reach zero when the sensor reaches thermal equilibrium with its environment. But as long as that offset button is pressed, it's gonna, the instrument is gonna continue subtracting that original reading from all measurements and that offset subtraction will become increasingly wrong as the sensor approaches thermal equilibrium. There is no shortcut. You need to wait until the sensor is in thermal equilibrium with its environment and then you can start working. There's no magic way around that. Um, I should mention that a question that might come to your mind when I'm measuring a laser beam for more than a few seconds at a time, the sensor can get quite hot. Uh, so isn't that also causing thermal offset? Isn't that also causing heat to be radiated into the environment, which is going to mess with my measurement? So the answer is no, because that heat is being created by the absorption of the laser beam that I'm measuring. That thermal offset was part of the calibration that we did on that, on that sensor. So that offset is not a bad offset. When there's no laser, that offset will go away. Uh, so what you might ask is the point of that offset button that we just saw. 
That is to zero out the effects of constant sources of thermal or optical, same thing, offset nearby. If you've got a light on in the room or you've got a heat source somewhere near the sensor, uh, before I turn on the laser, I measure the effect of those, I can press the offset button and that's a bad offset that's constant. And when I remove that, I've actually made my measurements accurate. I've removed an unwanted offset, but uh, those are the only kind of offsets that we want to get rid of using this function. Okay, backscatter, and then we're almost done. Um, let me just share my screen again to show you where this problem is, problem, where this challenge is coming from. Let's have a look at, wait, let, wait till this menu disappears from my face, uh, here. Okay, so if we look at the specifications, the thermal broadband absorber, uh, I will mention that the thermal broadband absorber itself, I keep using that as an example, absorbs around 90%, 91, 92, 93, 89, depending on the wavelength. Here you'll notice that it absorbs much high, much a much higher level because that uh, reflective cone trick keeps a lot more of the light in, all right? But so we still have uh, backscattered power of around three and a half percent. That doesn't sound like much, but three and a half percent, if I'm measuring, you know, 10 or tens of kilowatts, is still quite a bit of power that's being reflected back out into the room. Granted, it's a diffuse reflection, but still it is a potential safety hazard. So at Ophir, um, and if I, I imagine others as well, we have an optional accessory called a scatter shield. I don't know if you can see in the photograph here that the inner surface of that is kind of inward facing ridges. And basically that reflects back inwards something like 70% of that three and a half percent that was backscattered out. Uh, so a lot more of the light is sent back in for a second try at being absorbed and 90 something percent of that will be absorbed. Ah, so now for a given wavelength, my sensor is now absorbing more than it otherwise would have. Good question. Um, so the, the instrument is going to need a additional calibration setting. So I, I tell the instrument if I'm measuring a beam whose wavelength is 1064 nanometers, 532 nanometers or whatever, there have to be additional settings for the scatter shield in situation. But obviously we do. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, a nice uh, accessory to use. Okay, the last two items, footprint and production floor integration. First, a few words about footprint. The, you saw the images of those 10, 20, 30 kilowatt sensors. They are pretty massive and they need to be because they're being placed in the path of a heck of a lot of laser power. And there needs to be room for the cooling water and the plumbing associated with it. Uh, in industrial settings where we've got a whole bunch of welding stations or whatever, and each in each welding station, there's a laser head, workpiece comes in before it starts working on the workpiece, the laser head moves to the side, fires into a sensor, the system makes sure that it's okay. If it's not okay, the system makes a few internal automatic adjustments, and then the laser head moves back into place over the workpiece work piece and begins working. Obviously, we're not going to be sending a human operator into that work cell uh, with a handheld laser power meter. It doesn't work like that. Um, the good news is there are ways to avoid having to use massive water-cooled sensors. At Ophir, we call that mode pulsed power. Basically, what we're doing is we're exposing the sensor to that very high power only for a very short period of time, fraction of a second maybe, and we're treating that as a single pulse of energy and we're measuring the energy of that pulse. The user doesn't have to think about any of this, obviously, this is all done internally. And we measure the energy of that pulse, which is a standard thing to do with these thermal sensors. And when we divide the energy by the known exposure time, we get the instantaneous power that was there during that pulse. Okay, that obviously could be done manually and you measure the energy in energy mode and you whip out your, okay, nobody uses calculators nowadays. You whip out your cell phone. Uh, obviously, we don't want to work like that. So it can be done what 
we might call semi-automatically. And at Ophir, we have a couple of sensors, and they're small sensors because they don't need the water cooling, because even though they're going to be exposed to very high power, it'll only be for a very short period of time. So the total amount of heat coming in is not so bad. Uh, and then in a semi-automatic instrument, the meter prompts the user to enter the exposure time. I'm just going to share my screen again and show you what that looks like. Um, I cheated. We did this video earlier. Uh, wait. Uh, is it this guy? Yes, it's this guy. Okay. Um, here we are. Okay. It, you're in, we're in pulse power mode. It asks you for the pulse width, the exposure time. The user has to enter that. That's why I'm calling this semi-automatic. And he fires that laser pulse, quote unquote, and he's given a readout in units of power. Now, for three milliwatts, we don't need to worry about this. Three milliwatts is not what's going to be going on in that welding cell in the factory floor, but three milliwatts is about what I'm able to reproduce in my office when I'm filming a video like this. So uh, it's for pedagogical purposes. Uh, that's the semi-automatic me semi method. For production floor integration, even that's too clunky. So, you know, again, welding cells or cutting, drilling, whatever it is. So what's usually done in these kind of situations is that we use instruments that are designed to be fully automatic. There's no buttons to press here. There's no screen like there is in the handheld meters, okay? It's all done automatically. There's even a fast photo detector in these that measures the exposure time itself automatically. Um, I actually am holding exactly such a device here. It's got a remotely, when it wants to take a measurement, the server will send an instruction to remotely open up the protective cover. It fires the beam into their short exposure. Don't need water cooling. It's small industrial construction of the, of the instrument, industrial connectors, and so on and so on. You, you get the idea. Um, and these generally uh, communicate with the rest of the factory floor network using standard industrial communication protocols, Profinet, Ethernet over IP, Ethercat, as the case may be. Uh, okay. I said it would be 45 to 50, we're at 52. Okay, not bad. So that's basically what I wanted to cover. So we talked about that. We did a very, very brief overview of the basic principles of how these guys work, really, really basic. We talked about preventing uh, laser damage. We talked about damage thresholds um, and that they depend among other things on the power level. We talked about cooling and let me just re, re repeat the warm recommendation to uh, turn on the cooling water before you turn on the laser. Um, keep the sensor clean, both before it gets dirty and after it gets dirty. Uh, make sure the sensor is in thermal equilibrium with its environment. And then if there's a constant background offset, then you can zero that out using whatever offset function your particular equipment has, because then you'll be removing bad offset. Um, backscatter, there's a potential safety hazard. There are generally uh, accessories that uh, can be supplied by the sensor manufacturers to minimize the backscatter. And when dealing with uh, factory floor integration, uh, there are instruments that, are n that don't look like the laboratory type instruments. These are industrial instruments that are meant for factory floor integration. They're much more automatic and they're operated not by a human operator pressing buttons, but by the factory floor network and the server that's controlling it. Uh, okay, that's what I wanted to cover. I hope this was helpful. I realize it's a lot of information. I hope I didn't speak too fast. I think that based on the time, the side of the planet that I'm speaking to now probably doesn't have a problem with that, I hope. Uh, if you have any questions you want to ask online, you have a few more seconds in which to ask that. Um, my name again is Mark Slutsky, Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions at Ophir Photonics. Uh, this is my email address. I'm going to leave this slide up for a minute or so. And again, as I said at the beginning, you can contact me, you can contact us. If you're not sure who to contact, who us is on our website, you can see, you know, per country, uh, at the top main menu, the right hand most item is contact us. And there per country, you can see 
who it is that you want to be speaking to. And at the bottom of every page on our website, there's another, another uh, way to contact us. Okay, thank you very much for being with us. I hope this was helpful and dare I say, maybe even interesting. Uh, have a really nice rest of the day.